two. Hi, this is, um, I'm going to tell the tale of the bad man. Uh, actually, it's one of two bad men. The other one's still alive, so we don't talk about that one yet. But um, this one comes from high school, um, ultimately. So I have to go back to high school first. He was the class hood. His name was Phil Lohman, L-O-W-M-A-N. And, you know, these guys with their rolled up sleeves and their white t-shirts with their low slung jeans, their 501s, no doubt, and their um, um, ducktail haircuts and, and so on. They all were the same and they were all, you know, standing by cat calling all the girls as we walked by. And most of us tried to keep our bodies stiff so they wouldn't um, be interested. Meanwhile, I was a, a prudish and pious and elitist um, young one who was uh, going with the student body president. His name was Dick High. So we have Dick High, which has its own funny connotations anyway, and Phil Lohman, both of whom I ended up marrying, by the way, not just Phil, but Dick before that. And uh, they had their own drama that I don't know if I'll have time to tell, but they had their own drama in high school, which I found out about much later. Okay, so now let's fast forward to the 20th, and 20th reunion of our high school class. We were the class of 1960, so this is 1980. And I don't know if, if people go to the high school reunions. They're kind of fun because you're, you're watching each other age, first of all. But at that age, when you're only still not even 40, you, you know, a lot of you haven't aged that much, and I certainly hadn't much, and I was really proud of that fact, and, and, and you know, just being really full of myself because I had just um, done this successful magazine and in Twin Falls, Idaho, um, uh, my hometown, done this community magazine that really galvanized all sorts of people, and I was now on my way to Findhorn, the the shining city on the hill for new age communities and I was going to give a workshop on the magazine open space that I had created. Okay, so that's the background uh, of that that reunion. Okay, so we're there and all these people are well dressed, you know, trying to impress each other except one guy walks in late and he's like, he said he had just gotten out of the South Hills where he was mining for gold, or maybe it was silver, I don't know, mining for some precious metal. And he had a dirty t-shirt on and he obviously wasn't trying to impress anybody. And I really was impressed by that. And then I got closer to him and I noticed he had very glittery eyes, which was interesting to me. Um, I wasn't sure why he had those eyes uh, and it kind of fascinated me. Well, we ended up, the two of us, spending the night together, and the only sexual experience we ever had together actually was that night. The next day uh, was the school class picnic, which was the second event of the, of the reunion. And we were sitting there on the grass in the park with my friend Mary, and Mary was clearly uncomfortable with him. Um, you know, I was too, and I was not even acknowledging that yet, but I was d distinctly uncomfortable with Phil. And um, he doesn't say very much. He's a kind of a laconic figure. And, um, and on the way home, I decided I'm gonna, when we get home, I'm gonna say, please leave now. It's, you know, this has been fun, but I, I need to be on my own and get ready to go to Finhorn. And um, so, you know, I kind of composed what, what I would say to him before I said it. And we sat down to, at the table and I said, okay, Phil, we, we just can't go on. Uh, I'd like you to leave today. And he just, looked down at the table, then looked at me, and then he said, I think I'll ignore that remark. Well, I was still at the phase of my life where that kind of excites me, somebody that defies me like that, especially a guy, because it's rare. And so our interest, or my interest in him, newly kindled, newly rekindled, I should say, even though I was afraid of him and still didn't really know it, uh, and so he said he would take care of all the house business until we, we left for Finhorn. Now he's going to come with me. He's determined that he's going to come with me. Oh, okay. So, and what I wanted to do was burn my journals, all the journals that I had kept since I was 23 years old. 
And I sat in this chair in front of the fireplace and burned them page by page, reading all those journals through. That was like a, a closing ceremony for that period of my life. Meanwhile, he was doing all the dishes, he was doing the cooking, he was doing the buying of the food, he was taking the kids, but my, my boys who were now um, 12 and 15, something like that, maybe not quite that old, 10 and 12, Anyway, he was taking them to swimming and out in the desert um, to hike around and, and, and telling them all sorts of things. He, he, he was like a Pied Piper for them and they really enjoyed him. And so I was glad that they enjoyed him and he enjoyed them it, like his kid self was there with them. And, and it turns out the kinds of tales he was telling them, I found out about later, uh, he had been a, I knew this, he had been a Black Beret and that means something even beyond Green Beret. And he had operated as I, apparently an assassin of some sort and a sharpshooter. And he'd been in Vietnam before the Vietnam War. And he'd also been dropped into other places in swamps and so forth. And he was there, you know, he, he had done all sorts of nefarious things for the US military. And looking back on it, I would say now that he was a classic case of PTSD. Um, didn't talk much, um, you know, was, uh, seemed soulless, really, like his soul really wasn't present. Um, but here I was, I'm going to go to Findhorn with this guy. Now, I was already going, oh my God, how can I go to Findhorn? I still smoke. They're perfect there. I can't possibly, I can't, I gotta stop smoking before I get a Findhorn. And then how am I gonna take this weird man with me to Findhorn? He will simply not fit into all these spiritual types. And so I was very concerned, but, but still he, he was leading, I was letting him do it. Okay, so we get to now, okay, the kids leave, they go back to their dad. And now we have to go up to catch him to get rid of his stuff and pick up his truck and put a bed on the truck so that we can drive through Montana because he does, what he does is um, salesman work for sports calendars. He's a traveling salesperson. And so he's gonna make a circuit through Montana and then we're gonna go on down to Los Angeles where we're gonna take the people's up. There's a People's Airline at that point that's very cheap over to Scotland. That's the plan. Okay. Well, the first thing that happens is the very night we get there to, to catch him, he gets up in the middle of the night and goes into the bathroom and, and doesn't come out. And I, I get up finally and I say, what's going on? And he said, I'll call your dad. I've just had a bleed. And I go, what? Well, it turns out that he had bleeding ulcers and he had liver disease, okay? And this is how I found out. My dad, it turns out, I found out later, had said that there was a man that came into the hospital, my dad's a doctor, had come into the hospital and he was trying to tell all the doctors what to do and he couldn't stand the guy. Well, of course, this was Phil. So dad said, no, he would not come. Take him to the emergency room, he said. So took him to the emergency room and he had the first of a number of bleeds. Uh, sometimes he'd bleed out half his blood uh, and that took, I don't know how many days to recover. Then he's recovered. And this happens over and over again. Uh, so now, okay, so he's there. We now put something on the truck, but it's too big a, a box for the truck. Uh, it's too big. He says it's too big. I said, no, it'll be fine. Well, I won that argument. So we put it on the truck. We start up a long road in Idaho going to the Teton Mountains and the truck catches on fire. And, oh, and this is the first of many breakdowns all the way through Montana where we're now starting to use the money I had saved from my newly wrought astrology um, consultation um, business to go to Findhorn. We're now starting to use it up rather than be able to gain more money. And all the way through Montana, this was a problem. And then we were on our way to Los Angeles and all of a sudden in the middle of the night, I'm in the back in the bed and he stops the truck. 
he gets out, there was a flat. There were five flats during that time. It's all having to do with the fact that this thing was too big for the truck. And he gets out and he was so angry, so obviously furious that he threw the tire iron, uh, iron across, he threw it with great force. I don't know how far it went, but it really scared me, the fury in this man that had been underneath all this time. Okay, so now we get to LA and he has a very nice mom we're there, we're gonna take the, the, the flight out to Scotland the next day. I'm taking a nap and I realize I can't go with him. I can't do it, I can't do it. And um, I, he comes into the room and I say, I gotta go by myself, I can't take you with me. And he says, fine, then I'll just go drink myself to death. Oh, oh no, oh, you can't do that. Now before that, he had not even acknowledged that he drank alcohol, much less that he was an alcoholic, which of course had been the source of all his physical illnesses. But he got me because I wanted to save him. By this time, even though I was afraid of him, I also wanted to save him, I wanted to heal him, I wanted to save him, I wanted you know, to help him, it was just, Sheer bullshit. This is where I was going to get my power, I thought. Okay, so, uh, all right, we're not going to go to Findhorn because we really don't have enough money to do both of us. So instead, we, with the money we have left, we buy a trailer to haul behind the truck rather than the thing that was killing the truck, which was too big for it. So now we, we're starting up and we're going to back to Idaho because that's where he wants to go. And we end up at a place called Gandy Dancer, which is really a, an enclave of, it looks like ex-cons to me. I mean, that's what it felt like at the time. And he would go back and forth selling his calendars from Gandy Dancer. Meanwhile, he had gotten this black dog, which I look at now and I think, thank God for the dog. I mean, he got the dog because he thought that would keep me there. And it did. Uh, and the dog was a black German Shepherd. I think it's called an Austrian Shepherd. His name was Bo. That's what I named it. And he became my protector in this whole situation. So at Gandhi Dancer, we were in the midst of a eucalyptus forest and I would walk Bo every day. All the other people were afraid of the forest, but I was not afraid of the forest, probably because of Bo as my guardian. Meanwhile, Phil was usually gone doing his is traveling for the to get more money okay but then one day he bled out again so there we are back in the vets hospital again he is a vet remember so he gets free care back in the vets hospital again and this time he's saying to me we've got to get married and I go what we've got to get married that's the only thing that's gonna make me better I went home to the, to the Gandhi dancer and I said, oh my God, okay, I will make him out a contract. He has to sign the contract in order to be married. And the contract said that we were gonna stay married until he was better. <laughs> like, I didn't notice that this was perfect for him. He doesn't ever have to get better that way because we'll stay married until he's better. And I had him sign it he was fine with that. He signed it. You know, he had to follow very strict rules of nutrition and exercise and so forth, according to me. I mean, that was the dumbest thing I ever did. Well, maybe not the dumbest, but it was pretty dumb. So we go get married in this little chapel, just the, just the way you think of it. And it was um, not in Las Vegas, it was Vegas, but it was near Las Vegas. Um, you know, chapel that's like 10 feet long and and you're going up the aisle and there's somebody that's hired to be the witness and and it just felt like complete fake everything about it felt fake but I did it anyway because I was gonna heal Phil okay we get back got enough money now to get up to Idaho we get to Idaho and my parents did let us stay the first night 
in their place. And then, wouldn't you know, he bled out again. This time he tells me, go please get me, the parent, nobody was home, it was just the two of us, go get me of the biggest pan you can. So I brought him a huge bed pan, uh, bread pan, making bread, and he filled that with blood twice. That's how much blood he, lose, he would lose. Once again, off to the vet's hospital, and now it's Boise. So we're in Boise for two months. I'm walking Bo every day. You know, he's promising he's going to get better and so forth. But he wants to go back to Ketchum. So we go back to Bellevue, which is near Ketchum, and we're able, amazingly, to get a house which is a, um, with a balloon payment at the end of a year. And so he didn't have to pay until then. So we got in the house. We had no money, no, no extra. So we, we furnished the house from the dump, which was a great dump in Sun Valley, Idaho, no problem. And my kids came from the summer. They were excited to see Phil again. Again, he would do stuff with them. Meanwhile, I was thinking, I got to get out of here. This does not feel good. I'm not going to stay much longer. How can, I, how can I do it? So I decided I need to get my own money. So I started to um, work for the, the newspaper there as a typist. I said I didn't want to be a reporter. I couldn't take on that responsibility, but I could be a typist. So I was a typist. And I made one friend there, which was crucial, it turns out. Okay, so the summer wears on. He wants the kids to stay. I, I say the kids can stay if they want. But their father says, you have them stay and I will send the U.S. Marshal out there. And that's impossible. That's not, you know, they've got to come back. So they did go back. He takes them back to the airport in Boise. And when he comes back, he has his niece with him from California. He had arranged so that she'd come if the kids, if these kids were gone, he'd have another kid there because he knew that meant I would stay because I couldn't leave the children. So his niece is there and she's having problems with her parents. So she loved, she loved Phil too. The kids loved Phil. There's this part of him that energized them and they energized him. Okay, so they're there, but he's going out for the evening. So she and I are sitting there at the table and I'm thinking, oh my God, I'm just about to leave. And then she comes. So we start talking about Phil and she starts talking about what she knows about Phil. And I start telling her the stories that he's told me about his life. And she says, but that isn't true. She kept contradicting everything he said. And because she spent quite a bit of time, or her mother spent quite a bit of time with him. So what happened was I had to wait until the scales fell from my eyes before I could actually leave. And that was the night they did. That's the night that I recognized that he had been lying to me systematically the whole time. He still told me that he didn't drink, of course. But I knew that something was off. And now I was finding out more and more. And I decided, okay, that's it. I'm out of here in the morning. I will take her and leave. I'll take her back to the airport, send her back to her parents. And I'm out. So we go to bed. So one o'clock, I'm awakened by a voice that says, center yourself. You have one minute. So I did. I woke up. I sat up. I centered myself just in time to hear the truck door slam, to hear the front door slam, to hear the inside door slam, to hear him walking unsteadily, but but towards the bedroom door and then I saw him uh, his face I saw him his face with light behind it and then he sat on the bed and when he sat on the bed I was like stunned because years earlier I had had a dream in the dream I was riding my horse to the sun, to the, to the rising sun, just the way I used to do it when I was a kid. She wanted to go home again. She wanted to turn around and go home again. So we rode back and we came to a big, uh, a big stone wall with a gate. It was an open gate and there was a wolf sitting in front of it. And the wolf had yellow 
eyes. And I had to pass by the wolf in order to go home again. This dream was a big dream, a numinous dream. And I always felt uneasy about it because even though I had gone home after that, a, a year later, to marry Dick, my high school boyfriend, for two years, and then lovingly divorced, even though I'd gone home again, there was still something missing. I didn't know what it was. But when Phil sat down on the bed, I saw that the iris of his eyes were yellow. Not the whites of his eyes, the iris of the eyes. He had those wolf's eyes. And I was about to find out what actually going home again, which means what taking my power meant, really taking my power, the sun opposite Pluto. So for the next five hours, I had to take power over this man who was a mean drunk, sullen and mean. And he was clearly showing me now that he was a drunk. He got his guns out. He was polishing them in front of me in a very menacing manner. And I was holding his attention the whole time, staring into his eyes the whole time, needing, of course, to protect his niece as well. And finally I said to him, Phil, I'm going to call the police now. And he said, and I reached for the phone, he said, no, you're not. He said, I'll call the bartender. Okay, the bar that he had gone to that night, the bartender came over at 4 a.m. when I talked to him. I, he called and I talked to him and I said, would you please come over here? I need you so I can leave, leave here now and I don't feel safe. And he came over, I'd never met him before. This stranger walked in and um, he kept Phil from hurt, hurting me. I walked out to, go, to start up my car and he had pulled the spark plugs. <coughs> I realized later, he had pulled the spark plugs before he even walked in the house. It's like he knew I was gonna try to get away. So I had to take his horrible old truck. So I took the horrible old truck and went to the nearest um, phone booth, called the one friend I'd made in that valley, another person that you know, was a lifesaver asked her if we could hide there at her house for a couple of days until I figured out what to do next and hide the truck, which we did. And then I was able to get the car because what happened then? Of course, he had another bleed. I found this out because somebody else had seen him. So he was again in the hospital in Boise. So I could go and get the, the car, my own car, find out where it was, get my car and leave and I headed out to Twin Falls, and I thought, how, you know, how long will I be able to stay here? And I was there like five days, and finally I woke up one morning, and I thought, I've got to get out of here right now. I have to leave. So I went, got in my car, headed off down the road, and my friend Ellen, whose house I was staying at, she said, Phil called an hour after you left. And he said to me, where's Anne? I said, I don't know. She said, I truly didn't know exactly where you were, so I said, I don't know. And he said, well, I'm bouncing off the wall like a ball, <laughs> whatever that meant. But I had to endure for the next two years the feeling that he might be stalking me at any time. I didn't know. And so it was a very uncomfortable time until I finally found out that he had died. And that was a huge relief as you can imagine. Then, later, years later, I'm passing with Phil, with, with Jeff, my fourth husband. We're passing by the town of Malad, Idaho, where his grandfather lived. And Phil had always loved his grandfather. And I wondered, could Phil be buried here? Would the army or the military have, have buried him in a place that he wanted to be buried? I just thought he probably did want to be buried where his grandfather lived. And so we found a motel 
And we went to the little cemetery there and we were walking around and trying to find it. Is he buried here? No, I don't see him. I don't see him. We were on our way out and all of a sudden there were three servicemen and he was the middle one. And I walk up to his grave and I burst into tears. And that's when I recognized that Phil and I had a soul connection, even though he felt soulless in this life. There was a soul connection that brought us together and that even though he was a difficult person, I was just as difficult and I was definitely trying to take power over him. And I definitely found my power through that evening when I had to center myself because I only had one minute. That's all.